This is a little lecture. I've, I've got part, parts of this I've given before, but most of this is new. This is the research that we did in Japan because we're trying to figure out a way to mitigate the failures with implants that these darn bugs cause. And it happened that my research for my postdoctoral master's degree happened to be in fluoride research. And I, it was a very productive master's program that we ended up in um, major publications in the four major uh, dental research journals at the time, oral biology, uh, Archives of uh, Biology, Dental Research, Calcified Tissue Research, and um, Carey's Research from the work that I did in my master's plus six other publications. But it had to do with the fluoride reaction with, on two surfaces. And we're showing the electron. We, we use scan electron microscopy, light microscopy. We used uh, infrared um, internal reflection spectroscopy. And we're showing the reaction of uh, sodium fluoride and stannous fluoride to su uh, surface uh, slabs cut from enamel. But little did I know way back then that what I worked then would be applicable today. Because as soon as I started learning about the problem we're having with implant failure and the fact that these things produce spores, I'm thinking, oh, we're screwed. And then I remembered the research that I'd done many years ago. So I went back in the literature and just followed what had been done since then. And some of the work had showed that um, fluoride does inhibit these spirochetes. And there are several articles to, to show that that happens. So actually, I've been working with fluoride for quite a few years. I lectured first on it probably in 1999 at the Western District of American Academy, where fluoridating dense HA. And it worked, you know, so-so. But it certainly didn't prevent the infections that I was hoping. So I was pretty disappointed. But not that many, maybe two years ago, we started using Oxygen, which is a resorbable hydroxyapatite, and they're nanocrystals of pure hydroxyapatite resorbable. In other words, it's pure hydroxyapatite. It's not a sintered hydroxyapatite, which is a ceramic. So it had available hydroxy for reaction to fluoride. So when we started using that, all of a sudden we got dramatic results. So let's just talk about fluoride a little bit. It's, you know, you can argue fluoride till the cows come home, but damn, it's in the damn water supply. And no matter how you're going to argue it, people live with fluoride in their water and nothing happens except maybe if it gets too high, you get some fluorosis of the teeth. But I can't think anybody's ever shown any ill uh, effect of, of natural occurring fluoride. It's like a natural mineral, which our body actually does need. You know, it's like iodine and several other trace minerals. We need it. But dentists have a tendency to say if a little bit works, a lot works better. So they're putting it in topical, they're putting in vitamins, and then um, chewing gum. I mean, everywhere you could get fluoride, it was happening as it probably overdone. Okay, but a little bit of fluoride's good, a lot of fluoride's bad. So, <clears throat> um, I know the history, it, well, they found it back in, it goes back to 1933, and they found that, you know, even though it caused molding of teeth, it, you know, they weren't getting cavities. I mean, it's controversial to this day. San Diego, just last year, put it in their water supply after 40 years of research in some municipalities using fluoride for many, many years. But I have to use this one example. Japan, um, I guess they have a couple water supplies over there where there is excessive amounts of fluoride. There's one, one source or one um, a commodity that Japan has a lot of, and that's water. Man, they got water flowing out of that mountains. Everywhere you go, there's rivers flowing out of the mountains. But evidently, there's some springs that have way too much fluoride, and there was problems, so it totally prejudiced the Japanese against fluoride, and, and it's against the law in uh, Japan to use fluoride in a water supply or in anything for that matter. I guess they still can use it in toothpaste. So the consequences of that, after 30 or 40 years of fluoride use in the U.S., I mean, how many young people have cavities today? I mean, how many young people under 35 and 40 have gum disease today? But go to Japan, and by the time you're 30, you've got 25 root canals in your mouth. So that's the difference between their society and ours, at least you can attribute to fluoride or you can argue that it has nothing to do with fluoride, but coincidentally, they have tremendous amount of dental problems, although every time you go there and they go in their house, they bring you tea and sweets, so they're hooked on sweets too, but 
Fluoride does inhibit strep mutans, and as it turns out, it inhibits uh, treponema as well. The best part, is, I mean, in water supply, you need less than one part per million. Tea has 50 to 350 parts per million, but I mean, I, you know, is that available fluoride? Because fluoride is so reactive. When it reacts to something, it's, it reacts and it doesn't become available. So just because it tests to have 50 to 350 parts per million doesn't necessarily mean that that much fluoride is available for reacting with something else. Tin salmon and sardines, a tremendous amount more. Tin salmon and sardines with the skin and bones as anywhere from eight to 500 parts per million. So the, the, what we're interested in topical fluoride, when you react topical fluoride to, to structure, is an isomorphic substitution of the hydroxy on the apatite occurs forming fluoroapatite, and there's the chemistry of that. And essentially what we're doing is we're taking nanocrystals of hydroxyapatite and we're doing a substitution reaction on the surface. Although there's a recent uh, paper done in Washington where they're using um, electron microprobes in, on uh, surfaces and they think it might have to do to, with dissolution and reapposition. But we always figure it was an isomorphic substitution of hydroxy for fluoride. The way this works Hydroxyapatite neutral solution is virtually insoluble. Fluoroapatite and hydroxyapatite neutral virtually. I think it's, I just ordered my Merck index. I, I was going to have you look it up to see what the solubility of hydroxy and fluoroapatite, but as I remember from my research 40 years ago, it was 10 to minus 39. Both of them, both are about the same. So to get fluoride released from apatite at neutral solution, it basically is not available. In other words, the diffusion layer here of fluoride going in and going out, the fluoride going out is virtually none. But drop the pH down, which changes the diffusion layer, and it encourages fluoride to come into solution. So that's advantageous because we know that fluoride inhibits bacteria, especially strep mutans and then the treponemas, which are the spirochetes. But how do you deliver the fluoride so that it's effective without doing the adverse or the bad parts of fluoride in the body, which you can, you know, that fluoride is a poison. So how do you keep it tied up until you need it? Well, it turns out fluoroapatite is a good delivery uh, uh, vehicle for fluoride in, in a, um, in, um, infected area because infection always wants to drop the pH down. As soon as the pH drops down, then fluoride is leached out of, out of the appetite crystal and then it can inhibit the, the bacteria. This is the actual reaction going on at the surface. You get a fluoride substitution for hydroxy to form floral appetite. And then the excess fluoride reacts with the phosphates in the hydroxy appetite to form calcium fluoride and then that calcium fluoride serves as a reservoir for further incorporation of fluoride into the floral appetite. But there are several ways that fluoride works and actually Doug had the best explanation. It actually inhibits some of the, the processes of, of oxidation that are needed in metabolism in the Krebs cycle and that's how it kills bacteria and it's universal. So it kills all bacteria. Here's the studies here that if you want to look up Hughes um, that certain milligrams per uh, ml was found to, to suppress treponemas and 40 milligrams per ml completely inhibits the growth of treponema. Now it also affects acid production of bacteria. So when fluoride becomes available it uh, decreases the amount of acid production that a bacteria can do. And I know that in treponema they need low pH because bone resorbs to neutralize the pH that treponemas uh, provide. Because this stuff, using fluoride in this application is literally brand new. And then and this, this application, I think if anything that I've contributed to implant dentistry, this will be it. Because this is the answer to the infections that we're getting around implants. And we're talking about cavitrations in the bone. That's what I've treated with. We go in and clean out the cavitrations of bone and graft with the fluoridate HA. So far, I mean, Doug has had one that didn't work, but so far I haven't had any that didn't work. The HA absolutely works in every 